In this PowerPoint, we'll continue looking at basics of matter. In particular, we'll look at the two major classification schemes for different types of matter. The first classification system we'll look at focuses on the phase or state of matter. And there are four phases of matter. The three represented here are the three that we deal with most commonly here on Earth, solid, liquid, and gas. The fourth phase is plasma. So that can be created here on Earth. Uh, it can be created in lightning strikes or even in plasma TV or in the laboratory. It requires a lot of energy though, so it's not really a very common form here on Earth. It's much more common um, in the interior stars, for example. So I know you all probably have a good intuitive sense of what distinguishes solids, liquids, and gases, but let's define it more formally on both the macroscopic and the particulate level. So solids are substances that are considered rigid, and that means that they have fixed volumes and fixed shapes. If you consider a pen, it's going to have the same shape and occupy the same amount of space, whether it's in your hand, lying on the desk, or inside your book bag. And this reflects the positions of the particles within that solid. In a solid, there are strong attractions between the particles that hold them in place close to each other. And they're in relatively fixed positions that don't change over time. So the particles do move. I should clarify that. Uh, but they actually are vibrating in place. They're not necessarily moving past each other. And this is in contrast to a liquid. In a liquid, uh, the particles are also close together, and they're held in place by strong attractions, but those particles actually can flow past each other and move. And that allows the liquid to actually take on variable shapes. So if you take uh, some water in a bottle and pour it into a glass, the water will actually take on the shape of whatever container you put it in. The volume of that water, the amount of space that it actually occupies, will be the same between the different containers. It'll just be different shapes. And again, this reflects the particle nature of liquid. The particles are close, so fixed volume, but they can flow past each other, so variable shape. In a gas, the particles are actually far apart from each other. There's very little attraction between the particles, and as a result, uh, the particles can expand, they can contract, so that they fill whatever container that they're put into. So this allows them to take on both a variable shape and a variable volume. The second type of classification system allows us to distinguish between pure substances and mixtures. When we make this distinction, we're talking about the composition of the substance on the particle level. Pure chemical substances refer to matter that is made up of only one type of particle, like pure gold, which is made up of only pure gold atoms. A mixture is made up of two or more different types of particles that are simply mixed together. So a good example of that is the sugar water that's represented here. Now both pure substances and mixtures can be further broken down into two different types. Let's start with pure substances. So these can fall into two categories, pure elements or pure compounds. And the difference between the two is that elements cannot be broken down into simpler substances by chemical changes. Compounds can. On the particle level, elements are made up of atoms, and these are the smallest particle that can still have the same properties of that element. So the spheres in our STM photo of gold are atoms. So atoms actually, they can be broken down further, but it's not a chemical change. It requires a great deal of energy and nuclear transformations like nuclear fission to do so and the identity of the element would change in this process. The particles that make up compounds are most often called molecules, and these are actually atoms of different elements that are chemically bound together. And this is a critical point. 
The molecule acts as one unit and has completely unique properties from the individual atoms and elements that make it up as a result of that chemical bond. So all molecules of a compound are exactly the same. The same number of atoms of each element bound together in exactly the same way. And the chemical bond, again, is the key to the molecule, and it provides another way to distinguish molecules from atoms. Chemical bonds can be broken apart in chemical reactions, which means that molecules and compounds can be broken down into simpler elements and atoms. Let's talk a little more about the power of the chemical bond found in compounds. Consider the two elements, sodium and chlorine. Sodium is a metal so reactive that it has to be stored under oil. Expose it to water and it produces hydrogen gas and heat in an explosive reaction. Elemental chlorine isn't much better. It's a poisonous, pale yellow gas that's very reactive. Now, if you take an atom of sodium and an atom of chlorine and form a chemical bond between them, you form something that is completely different. It's sodium chloride. Table salt, not poisonous, not reactive at all. So chemical bonds allow compounds to have completely different properties than the elements that make them up. This is an important distinction between chemical compounds and mixtures. So the different particles that make up mixtures are not chemically bound to each other. Take, for example, sugar water. While sugar and water are individual molecules that contain atoms with chemical bonds within them, this makes them distinct particles, there is no bond between the water and the sugar molecule when we mix them. This means that both the sugar and the water molecules maintain their individual properties. And when we mix the two substances together, we can still distinguish those properties we can still taste the sugar in the water. We can further distinguish between compounds and mixtures using the law of constant composition. This law states that all samples of a pure compound contain the same elements in the same ratios. This means that a sample of pure water, whether it comes from your tap or from a spring in Australia, is always made up of water molecules that contain hydrogen and oxygen bound in a two to one ratio. If we change the ratio, we change the identity of the substance and it will no longer be water or have the properties of water. In contrast, you can have a mixture of sugar water that contains a lot of sugar or just a little bit of sugar. Regardless of the amount of sugar, it's still a mixture of sugar and water, and the properties of the sugar and the water can still be distinguished from each other. So compounds are made up of different elements that are chemically bound together into identical particles that have a constant or fixed comp composition. Mixtures are made up of di different particles that are not chemically bound together and can be found in any proportion. In other words, mixtures have variable composition. I mentioned earlier that mixtures can be broken down into two types. Those two types are known as heterogeneous or homogeneous. What they refer to is how well mixed the different particles are. In a heterogeneous mixture, the different types of particles are not completely mixed in with each other. You may see a large separation between the different type, types of particles, as in oil and water, or a smaller scale separation, as in the small droplets of vinegar and oil that form an emulsion when you shake salad dressing. The different particles in a homogeneous mixture are uniformly distributed throughout, on the particle level. A sports drink is an example. The coloring and additives are evenly distributed throughout the water so that each drop of that sports drink contains a uniform amount of different components and the solution appears homogeneous or like one substance throughout. All matter can be classified as either a mixture or a pure substance. And we can further classify mixtures as heterogeneous or homogeneous and pure substances as either elements or compounds. Making these distinctions takes practice and an understanding of the particle nature of matter. There are some basic questions you can ask yourself as you learn to distinguish the different types of matter. 
First, to distinguish between mixtures and pure substances, ask yourself whether all samples of the substance have constant properties in composition. When you think about gold jewelry, for example, you know it can come in different varieties. There's white gold, yellow gold, rose gold. There's also 14 karat and 18 karat gold. The different varieties reflect different amounts and types of other metals, like copper and silver, that are mixed in with the gold when it's used to make jewelry. So the gold used in jewelry does not have constant properties or composition. Therefore, it's a mixture. Furthermore, it's a homogeneous mixture. While jewelry gold is made up of different metals, in varying composition, those metals are uniformly mixed throughout to give the jewelry a uniform appearance. So therefore, homogeneous. Now there is a pure element gold, but all samples of the pure gold have the same properties of color, density, hardness, etc. Furthermore, all the samples of pure gold cannot be simplified or broken down into simpler substances by chemical reactions. So pure gold is considered an element. Let's look at a few more examples. Let's start with a sample of granite. Now granite, as you probably know, comes in a wide variety of different colors and patterns. Right away, that gives you an answer of no to the question of constant composition and property. This picture is of pink Milford granite, and it's pink because it has a higher percentage of a mineral known as potassium feldspar, which has a pink or salmon color. The black specks are a different mineral known as biotite, and the white are a mix of quartz and another feldspar known as plagioclase feldspar. You can see clearly that the minerals are not uniformly distributed. There are specks and pockets of different colors. So this is a heterogeneous mix. Now let's look at a diamond. You need to know a little bit about diamonds and their composition to figure this one out. If you do know diamonds, you know that they are made up of carbon, and that's it. All diamonds are made of pure carbon in a specific crystalline arrangement. And this diamond picture here is actually man-made, but you wouldn't know it. Even though it was made in the laboratory rather than deep under the ground, it's still a brilliant, clear example of crystalline carbon. So diamonds do have constant composition and properties. That makes them a pure substance, and they're made up of only one type of particle, and that's carbon. Carbon can't be reduced into simpler substances by chemicals reactions, so this is considered a pure element. Next, we have a picture of apple cider. Now you know that apple cider can come in alcoholic or non-alcoholic varieties, and different samples of apple, apple cider can have different tastes. So this indicates that it's not uh, a constant composition or properties, so it's a mixture. This particular glass of cider looks fairly homogeneous and uniform throughout. It's a clear solution with nothing floating or settling out. So we'll label this particular glass of apple cider as a homogeneous mixture. Truthfully, that can't be said for all samples of apple cider. Sometimes they do have particles floating in it or something settling out of that apple cider, but we'll take it for homogeneous for this particular sample. Last but not least, we have baking soda. So baking soda certainly appears uniform and with constant properties. All samples of baking soda have this white powdery appearance. That indicates a pure substance. The real proof though is in the ingredients list on the box. For baking soda, there's only one thing on the label, sodium bicarbonate. Baking soda is a pure substance made up of only one thing. Now, is it an element or a compound? It's actually easiest to eliminate it as an element. If it's an element, we should be able to find sodium bicarbonate on the periodic table. We can find sodium, we can find carbon, but there is no sodium bicarbonate element. This is a compound. It contains sodium and it contains carbon as well as hydrogen, 
but these atoms are chemically bound together so that baking soda has completely distinct properties compared to those of the elements that make it up. That means baking soda, or sodium bicarbonate, is a pure compound. So in summary, all matter can be classified based on the particle nature of the substances involved. Different phases reflect different relative positions and attractions of the particles, and matter can also be classified by composition of the particles involved. <laughs>